you, it didn't move. I turned the patient right lateral to Q. It didn't move. I sat the patient up. It didn't move. So now, and notice their annotation. Right lateral to Q and sitting. It's not moving. So this is a non-mobile stone. Now, if this was in longitudinal, I would measure it from here to here because I can see that. If it's in transverse though, is this part of the wall or is this part of the gallbladder? I don't know. If this was in transverse, I hope we'd measure it from here to here. Because is this wall? I don't know. But I'm going to give the measurements to the doctor and let him make that choice. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. It's better to have the measurements on the films than to not have them on the films. So they, they, they can use it or they can't use it. Either or. Okay. Okay. So this was a non-mobile stone. It is very important for us to give the sonographic features of a stone. We have to scan the gallbladder in multiple planes. We used to have to use a variety of techniques. Mine is usually laying on supine, I mean laying on prone and then shaking them. That's what I do. You're gonna develop your own. Some people have their patients cough. Because so that will do it also. Uh, you're gonna change your, uh, your patient positions into any position that you can use. Mine are usually going to be LPO, the cube, and LAO, and I'm gonna change my transducers uh, as I go. So make sure you have all of your transducers in, uh, in the ports ready to go. Pitfalls uh, could be uh, bowel gas or the ligamentum teres. Why would the ligamentum teres be a problem for me? Because it's hyperechoic, right? Yeah. The only thing about the ligamentum teres, it will travel with your transducer. So the ligamentum teres is what separates the left lobe into medial lateral. So if I'm in the cube, what am I doing? I'm throwing the liver towards my left lobe of the, of the thing. So. Mm -hmm. You've got to be careful of that. Okay. Uh, another pitfall. Uh, one of you did this on your final that you measured the IBC as the gallbladder wall. Hmm. So things happen, especially when we get into a hurry. Uh, we can lose our anatomy. Uh, you can have egg sha edge shadowing, meaning that when the ultrasound hits a curved object, then you'll have that shadow on each edge. Okay, and the gallbladder is a curved object. So also, if you have scarring or surgical clips in that area, you still have to document the gallbladder fossa, whether they've had a cholecystectomy or not. You have to take pictures sagittal and transverse of the gallbladder fossa. Uh, false negatives, you can use uh, inappropriate techniques like reverberation, causing that artifact. 
uh, the wrong transducer frequency. Uh, you have to be sure to work your focal zones. You have to pay attention to your, your gain settings. You might have a Phrygian cap or a Hartman's pouch. A Phrygian cap looks like the that's at the fundus, and the Hartman's pouch is near the neck. So we've got to make sure that when we have a layering of stones that we're not looking at bowel gas, okay? Oh, wall echo shadow. We call this the west sign, wall echo shadow. It's a triad. What happens, you see the wall, you see the echo, and you don't see anything posterior to that. That means that the gallbladder is completely impacted. <coughs> wall echo shadow. Now, you could have a wall echo shadow if they've had a barium exam. A barium exam is done under fluoroscopy and in radiology and where they fill the colon with a, a, a liquid that coats the colon and sometimes that barium can uh, solidify inside the bowel and uh, we can see the barium as a stone. You can have a porcelain gallbladder. A porcelain gallbladder is where the gallbladder wall is, is calcified. So uh, we can't see anything posterior to that. You could have air bowel loops that can be state, mistaken for gallbladder stones. You know, because if your bowel has air in it, it will be anechoic. And you can actually see fecal matter inside the, the, the lumen of the bowel, and we can mistake that for gallbladder stones. A differential a diagnosis for chronic cholecystitis. Cholecystitis is just inflammation of the gallbladder. Is adenomyomatosis, and we're going to be studying that. I love saying that word, adenomyomatosis, and uh, gallbladder cancer. So we're going to be studying all that. Okay. This is the west sign. I see a wall. I see an echo, and I don't see anything past the echo. Wall, echo, shadow. We call it the west side. It is on the registry. Oh, quiz. What laboratory values are associated with calcium obstructing either the cystic duct or the common bile duct? Alkaline phosphatase. Let's go look at that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. A S T and A L T. Yeah. Uh, okay. What term describes the double arc shadow sign? B. Oh, no. B. Wall echo shadow. Cholecystitis is inflammation of the gallbladder. And most of those are brought on from impacted stone within the gallbladder neck or the cystic duct. What is the cystic duct, Lauren? CD. Can you hear me? Yeah. Cystic duct? Uh, is yeah. the what is the cystic duct? Um, the duct? 
From the gallbladder. Yeah, from the gallbladder. <laughs> Thinking. <laughs> I just, like. I just want to explain. <laughs> um. What was the question? What, what is, is this? The CBD. The CBD. <laughs> Correct. Oh my gosh. Why am I going? No, it doesn't really? connect to the CBD. The cystic duct yes. joins the common hepatic duct. And at that point in time, it becomes the common bile. Okay? So, uh, Farnes, yes. what, what, what artery feeds the gallbladder? What artery feeds the gallbladder? The cystic artery. Artery, yes. Yeah. So that's easy to remember, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. So because uh, I apologize, you were asking me about Uber, but I don't know what was wrong. So um, I was able to hear you, but uh, my voice didn't go through. So I was trying to. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So when the question comes up, about what feeds the, what artery feeds the cystic duct, I mean, feeds the, the gallbladder, it is the cystic duct. And that's easy to remember because you already know that the cystic duct attaches the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct. Okay? One's a duct and one's an artery. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. Okay. So the uh, inflammation can lead to necrosis, where the tissue actually dies. Ulceration, it can become uh, infected. You can, uh, it can swell. And if it's swelling, we call that hydrox. If it's over four, four to five centimeters in transverse and over 10 centimeters in sagittal, then we have hydrops. It can also swell. Hey, Courtney, come look at the sky right here. Who is the sky? I've noticed him walking, but I don't know who he is. Hang on, guys. I've never seen him in the neighborhood. Oh, okay. I saw him yesterday, and now I saw him today. He may be in the new house in the corner. Why is, why is he looking in their car? Oh, he's got a dog. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, guys. Neighborhood watch here. Got to make sure we're safe. Right. <laughs> okay. So, if I can, if I get bacteria inside my gallbladder, any type of a bacterial infection will cause gas. Any type of a bacterial infection will cause gas. Patients will have right upper quadrant pain, positive Murphy sign, nausea, vomiting, distension, fever, right upper quadrant mass, and they could possibly have jaundice. These people come into us and they're pretty sick because they can't have any pain medication until they come to us. So it's gonna be in extreme pain. A lot of times the reason that, uh, uh, because the gallbladder is so close to the pancreas, they think that we have uh, acute pancreatitis. We can have a, a perforated peptic ulcer a liver abscess, or if I'm an alcoholic, I can have an acute alcoholic hepatitis. Laboratory values, I'm going to have uh, my uh, leukocytosis is going to be high. 
My liver values are going to be high, alkaline phosphatase, and my bilirubin is going to be high if I have jaundice. 20% of cholelithiasis will develop at some point in time into acute cholecystitis. Most of the time, you'll come into the hospital and they'll have, they call them episodes. And then at that first one, that's where we find out that they have cholecystitis with cholelithiasis. Medicate them, send them home, but then it, it, it's just reoccurring. It keeps coming back. Reoccurring. Because most of the time, gall, uh, gallbladder surgery is an elective procedure uh, because they can give you medication and diet uh, to take away the symptoms. If they have a positive murky, that have had wall thickening with gallstones, uh, pericholecystic fluid, they can have a high tropic uh, gallbladder. They're going to send these people to surgery if they come in through the emergency room. Okay? So we have to be very, very careful, especially if uh, we say that they have a positive patient. Uh, they will go ahead and schedule that patient for surgery right away. So notice the pericholecystic fluid in this patient. Gallstones. So here they call this adenomous gallbladder wall. Adenomous gallbladder wall. Or you could call it pericholecystic fluid because there is fluid on the outer edges of the wall. You do have posterior shadowing. Here you have fluid, and here you have fluid. Very cholecystic fluid. So here, how would I measure this? I'm going to give them two measurements. I'm going to give them this measurement right here, and I'm going to give them this measurement right here. Look at this measurement. Do you think that all of this is edema in the wall? Possibly so. But if I want to take a picture of that, I'm going to take a picture of this just in transverse. Does that make sense? I'm not going to measure this. We've already made the diagnosis. We've already made the diagnosis. But if you want to look at this area, then you have to go to that area. So here I have a hydropic gallbladder and I have increased blood flow. The patient has a positive Murphy, so I have acute cholecystitis. Because what happens is anytime I have an infection, the body's going to send extra blood flow to that area along with more white blood cells to fight this infection on its own. Okay, with this image here, I have hydropic because I'm going to measure this and I'm going to measure it from the wall, outer wall to outer wall. I'm going to throw on some color. I already know that the patient has a positive Murphy's. Okay, here I'm in long. It's definitely over 10 centimeters. Can't even get it in the same field of view. I have sludge, I have gallbladder stones, I have pericholecystic fluid, 
very cholecystic fluid. Okay. And um, acute cholecystitis. So here I have cholecystitis with duplication of the cystic duct. The cystic duct connects the gallbladder to the common hepatic duct. And uh, you can see that there's a stone lodged in the cystic duct, which we normally don't see. Sometimes a cholecystitis, it can resolve on their own. A lot of people will just stay home and not uh, be able to deal through the pain. But that's how come we see so many bad patients is because they do try to stay home. They know if they come to the hospital, they're going to be there for hours and hours and hours. So when it comes to the point where they can't stay at home, they can't handle the pain anymore, then that's when we see our really bad patients. And the only way that uh, acute cholecystitis can be taken care of is in that way, if they're, if they're already to the point where they're saying, okay, just, just give me a shot and make me die, <laughs> They're going to send those patients to surgery. <laughs> you can also go in there and uh, with ultrasound, you could do aspirations. I think they also do this with CT. Uh, they can go in and drain it with ERCP. They can treat it with antibiotics. And um, if they're a poor candidate, they're going to do other exams to keep from having to do a cholecystectomy. Okay, and one of those, it's an invasive procedure called an ERCP. Inflammation of the gallbladder, you can have an em emphysinimus cholecystitis. What does that mean? That the gallbladder wall is full of fluid. It's an adenomous uh, cholecystitis. I can also develop pathology in my gallbladder wall. My gallbladder can lose its um, uh, blood supply, so it can start necrosing and turn gangrene, and that will also uh, cause problems. Empemia, I can't remember what that is. I'll look it up for y'all. Uh, gallbladder perforation, it can burst. And if it bursts, then I can get peritonitis. And if I get peritonitis, then I can die. Uh, the differential diagnoses are uh, pneumonia, pancreatitis, Polydocal lithiasis, where I have um, uh, uh, gallbladder stones in my ducts, uh, hepatitis, liver abscess, a neoplasm, peptic ulcer, or heart disease, because it mimics all of those, because it's right upper quadrant and epigastric pain. What is the most common precursor of acute? Cholecystitis, most common precursor. Acute pancreatic? Oh no. I think it's D. D? D. I would say D. Impacted stones in gallbladder. Impacted stone in the gallbladder. Which of the following are considered secondary signs of acute cholecystitis? B? I would say it would be A or B because they didn't yeah. say anything about labs. Yes, 
Because mm-hmm. leukocytosis, the gallbladder's going, the body's going to try to get it well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would say if they have leukocytosis, but I would say gallbladder wall thickening. What do y'all think? Yeah. Yes. So it's B? It can be A or B. A and B. It would be A or B, okay. uh, considering the questions. Now, I can have cholecystitis without a stone. Okay. I can have cholecystitis without a stone. I can have... Uh, a hydropic gallbladder without a stone. What happens is the bile can get stagnant. Say, um, I'm going to a class reunion. So I'm going to fast for 30 days. I'm going to fast. I'm going to drink nothing but water. For 30 days. Well, that can lead to a calculus cholecystitis because if I don't have the hormones that my body's used to, then my gallbladder disease will start. The bile will get toxic because I'm not eating and um, I'm not going to be able to go to my class reunion because I'm going to be eating. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Not only does that bile turn toxic, you know, then uh, the it can also uh, it becomes stagnant, and then I can get a bacterial infection. Wow. Okay. Uh, I can get a thrombus of the the vessels that supply the gallbladder, and if that happens, if my gallbladder is dying because it's it's getting less blood supply or if it's not draining because I have a thrombus in the the cystic vein you know it, it, it can cause all kinds of problems and if nothing else the um, the gallbladder wall can perforate and then I have keratinitis so what can cause a calculus Trauma, trauma can cause it. Surgery, severe burns. And why severe burns? Because they're in ICU forever and ever and ever. They develop sepsis. What did we say this was? Oh, uh, tube feeding? Yes, tube feeding. Long, long tube feeding, prolonged fasting. That class reunion did really get me a job. Because I wouldn't want to go to a class reunion looking the way I do. I haven't seen some of those people in 50 years. <laughs> Diabetes. Diabetes would cause it. Or HIV. All of those are going to be reasons for a calculus cholecystitis. You'll see this, this, these a lot when you go up to um, the ICU. Because a lot of those people have been in ICU for a really, really long time. Okay. Clinical signs of, uh, they're not going to be nonspecific. Uh, they're going to be just like calculus, uh, cholecystitis. You're going to have a positive mercy, Murphy, nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension, fever, right upper quadrant mass. Uh, symptoms occur 24 to 50 out 50, 50 days after the initial event, but they usually will happen uh, after about two weeks. It has a very high morbidity and mortality rate. Both of them do. You'll have a distended gallbladder with a thick wall, internal debris or sludge. Uh, you won't have a gallbladder stone, but you can have debris where it you can actually see 
hyperechoic foci with within the gallbladder uh, gallbladder uh, my brain just went blank uh, within the gallbladder we'll put it that way okay you can have poly pericholecystic fluid pericholecystic fluid is usually going to be outside of the adenomous gallbladder wall okay um patients mental status or their medication status can sometimes uh hinder our evaluation uh, because we're not able to make the um, the positive Murphy sign. If they come into the hospital and they are to the point where they're almost hysterical because of the pain, they're going to give them something. But then they have, then we can't give a definitive positive Murphy because of the, what the pain medication has done. It's to relieve their pain, so we can't call it. A lot of times when you have these patients in the department, their pain is so severe. After you finish your exam, you call the ER to come down and give them their medication. Here you have um, a pericholecystic fluid. You have an adenomous gallbladder. Uh, you have sludge. Um, uh, the patient had the upper quadrant pain with um, nausea and vomiting. But look at these hyper echoic echoes here. Could that be stones within the cystic duct? We don't know. So we'll have to evaluate that. Okay. Here uh, we have. Uh, we don't see the edge of this gallbladder wall because of the, uh, the, the artifact that we have. So you would measure the gallbladder wall 90 degrees to the transducer. You wouldn't measure the sides because the sides make the edema wider because of physics. So you would measure it from here to here. Okay, because we can make this look thicker or make this look th thicker because of physics. Now, if I'm in transverse, when I take this image, when I take this image, I'm telling the doctor that I see no stones. So I'm going to take this image at the neck, the body, and the fundus, okay? The neck, the body, and the fundus. And that's why we teach you uh, the protocol that we do, because when we take those images, we're telling the doctor, I don't see anything here. I don't see anything here. I don't see anything here. So that way they can make the diagnosis of a calculus cholecystitis. So is it safe to take multiple uh, images the way we do? Yes. Instead of just, if, if, uh, you know we follow exactly. the protocol. Exactly. And Patricia, if I worked in a facility where I didn't have a radiologist there on site, I would do a CINI. I would do a CINI. Look at this gallbladder. Ooh, it looks nasty, doesn't it? <laughs> You're going to measure it. Here is pericholecystic. Here, here, this is a, a, a this is pericholecystic fluid right here. Here you have uh, edema, and the edema is thickened walls. It's not just fluffy. It's actually breaking down. Mr. For how many minutes uh, we have left? 
I'm sorry? How, how long we have left? Oh, I don't know. Uh, it's 11.22. Uh -huh. Do you need to leave? No, uh, cause uh, I'm gonna cut the, the video too long, so I'm gonna start a new one. I'm sorry? Cause I'm recording, so I just wanna make sure uh, okay, we're recording too long. Yeah, we might uh, quit after this, cause it is a lot of information. I don't know what comes next after this. Okay. Ms. Shepard, any updates? Any updates as far as a uh, lab and clinic, you know, with the, uh, you know, the COVID virus changing, the, sh the new shutdown? Uh, you're finished with the lab. Uh, you should have gotten your grade for scan lab three. So we're finished with that. Uh, but no, I haven't heard anything about clinic yet. I haven't heard anything about clinic. I did. Okay. What, what is this? July for August? Any update for August or for the fall? No, hadn't heard anything. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, we're still in stage two of recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, we told them that we would not come back until September. Mm -hmm. Probably two weeks before September, then we'll decide what, what we need to do. Now I can see us many I can see us implementing the lab. Hey Jerry, I can see us implementing the lab more if we can't go back to clinic in September. Okay. I can see us doing that. Because you've got to scan. That's right. the only way you're gonna get better is to scan. Yes, ma'am. So we haven't talked about it because we haven't gotten that far. We're just really taking it almost week to week. Uh, so we won't even discuss that until probably towards the end of August. And um, we'll still have our classes, but we'll break you up into groups and then like we're doing the juniors and do lab. If, if we don't go to clinic, we're going to send you to lab. Uh -huh. Now, uh, because we can maybe send you to Smith, but we certainly wouldn't send you to the hospitals. Yeah. There's a possibility we could send you to Smith. Because how many machines do they have there? Seven. They have six or seven? No, actually seven. seven. Yeah, I guess seven. They have seven. Okay, but we wouldn't want to put them over their mandate either. So we'll, we'll be in tune with that later on as we go further. Okay. Um, so the mortality rate is higher for a calculus cholecystitis versus acute calculus cholecystitis. If you're working at a facility that doesn't have a radiologist on site, but they have a radiologist that you send your films through, I would make a phone call to that doctor. I wouldn't just scan my material to him or her. I would actually make a phone call so they could send this patient to the to the hospital. Okay, do you understand what I mean by that? Because not all imaging facilities have a radiologist on site. Use your common sense. Just like if I had a DVT, say I had a DVT come in. I'm not just going to send those films to my radiologist. I'm gonna call my radiologist so he can call their doctor and send them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. I use your common sense. Yep. Uh, so this all goes along with it. Say lack of clinical and laboratory specificity in diagnosing, they come to an outpatient imaging center. 
just for right upper quadrant pain. They haven't been to the lab. They probably haven't been to the doctor, especially during this time. So, oh, I'm having right upper quadrant pain. The doctor's going to send them for imaging. And so they don't have any labs and they haven't even seen a doctor. So it's in your hands as a professional, as a professional, to make sure the radiologist doesn't miss that. So he can call the doctor and you're going to tell the radiologist because some radiologists, I'm not going to say that. It's your job as a sonographer, and you're going to say, Doctor, this patient doesn't have gallstones. He has pericholecystic fluid. He has edema of the gallbladder. He has a positive Murphy. It is, uh, so I need for you to call his doctor to let me know where I need to send him. Put the ball in his court. Don't let him or her determine that it's no big deal when you know that it is. Got it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Because that's your job as a professional. We're here to make sure that, that the patients are taken care of. Because it could be gangrene of the gallbladder. Because gangrene of the a gallbladder occurs with a calculus cholecystitis. So what's going to happen, especially if it's a low income person, they can't afford anything. They don't want to go to the hospital because they know they can't afford it. They're going to hard, have a hard time already paying for the exam. Don't, don't let them get out of your sight. If they need a ride, you make sure that they have a ride to call Uber, you know, charge it to the center to make sure that they can get to the hospital. Okay. Quiz. What history is common in the majority of A calculus cholecystitis cases? C. C. Patients that are in, in the ICU. Complicated cholecystitis. Patients with acute cholecystitis are at risk for developing what? Perforation. Is it not? Is it? Is it a quiz? I would or? say every one of them. It's not a quiz. Yeah. <laughs> I could say every single one of them. All black, gangrene, cholecystitis. It's not a quiz. It's not a quiz, Miss Ever. Oh, it's not a quiz. It's yeah, the new section. Oh, one quiz question. <laughs> oh, y'all are gonna miss me when y'all graduate. <laughs> So complicated code, okay. So now we do know. <laughs> complicated epine, epi, epipemia. It's pus in the gallbladder. Yes. Okay. Uh, it happens with diabetic people. You know what? Let's call it quits. I'm tired of talking. <laughs> Can we? Yeah. Or you need to go for another 15 minutes. No. That's yes. a lot of information yes. today. Yes. Right? Oh. Let's look into it. I'm ready for my nap. You're ready for your what? Oh, you're ready for your nap? My nap? Uh, yeah. Miss Shepard. Yes. Can you please just give me a clarification on obstructive jaundice, please? On those what? Obstructive jaundice. Obstructed jaundice? jaundice. There was a okay. question on the test. Okay, if I have obstructed jaundice, that means the bile cannot leave my gallbladder. And if it can't leave my gallbladder, that bile is going to back up because every time I eat, my body produces cholecystocytosis. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, it develops that so that way my ampulla of water relaxes 
so the bile can go through and help with my digestion. But if I have a um, if I have a stone in my bile duct, say it's at the head of the pancreas. Let's say it's at the ampulla of otter. Okay, so my it's at the, if it's at the ampulla of otter, it can't go through the sphincter of odi, which is the muscle that 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 controls the ampulla of otter. I have obstructive jaundice because my bile is backed up. Okay. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. There's something, I, but you know what? I can have obstructed jaundice even if I have a, a cancer of the head of my pancreas mm. because it's squeezing the common bile duct. So bile can't get through that bile duct because I have a tumor and so it doesn't have to be a stone. It could also be um, a, 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 a neoplasm of the pancreatic head. Okay, got it. But we're gonna study that more later on. What, um, forgot where we were now. Oh, this what slide number is that? That one. The next one. Oh. Okay. 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 I'm going to stop here. If that's okay with y'all. Yes. We've had a lot of information. Uh, we're going to start.